Welcome back, Warship fans. It is I, Uncle Barnaby, back again to chastise my idiot nephew. Once again, I have been forced against my will to narrate this incessant garbage, only this time under duress. You see, my nephew, the Hive Hound, is holding Martha's favorite doll, a Lady Scarlet, from Catherine's collection hostage, but he is not the only one that can play dirty. So with that in mind, let's enact some poetic justice. As we start this match on Shatter, to no one's surprise, Hive is playing the same overpowered plastic boat we seen last time, the Plymouth. I mean what Simpleton thought. Let's add another four barrels to the Edinburgh and put it at the same tier. That will be fair and balanced. But I guess Wargaming do have the right to put their hand up their elementary canal and pull out pure gold. Yes, that's right. If you want to captain this pay-to-win barge, it will cost you 17,500 doubloons. And if you're as sad and as useless as said nephew, then use this stat padder to make yourself look better than you are. Now I had to remove the audio, because Hive and his friend, the Monk 52, don't shut up. Not once this entire match rambling on about tactics and positioning. There is a contradiction. The Monk, who is not 52, who was not born in 1952, and has an owl as an avatar, is that to lull the choir boys into a false sense of security, with the indignations he is actually a man of the cloth. Who knows? It may just remain one of life's mysteries. Like how were the pyramids built? Did we really land on the moon and which ladyboy gave me that rash in Thailand? It just leaves me with more questions than answers. Anyway, as this pair of buffoons start the match, they begin pushing for the sea capture point. Probably because that's where the fun police are heading. Yes, we see you there, carrier player. That's a genre I still don't understand. What's the fun in sitting back and flying around the map to bother other players? It's like fighting a kitten. They have no way to retaliate. Fair and balanced seems to be the theme of the day. As Hive and the carrier unload on this poor Siegfried, so much so he may just think he's a Jackson Pollock painting. If you put him under a black light, he would make Chasey Lane blush. Poor soul barely into the fight, and he has already taken more of a beating than Joe Burden's wife. Running for cover, his only recourse, while Hive chuckles to himself like some sort of deranged psychopath. But alas, the Siegfried gets away, as Hive sits back, reminiscing about a quote from one of his personal heroes, there is always another victim. As he glances at the old newspaper cutouts, not one single article missed from his Jeffrey Dahmer collection. As Hive's buddy, the monk starts to take the B capture point. Everything seems a little stale at this point, no one willing to risk their ship for the greater good. Although this Colorado, seemingly oblivious to seeing the Siegfried getting the stepsister treatment, looks to be sailing into range of Hive and his guns. Almost screaming out, help me, stepbrother, I'm stuck. As Hive, being short, fat, and with greasy hair, gives it to the Colorado as if he was Ron Jeremy, only this time it's just six inches of penetration, but with that fire rate it is going like a sewing machine. Salvo after salvo, Hive chops down the health pool of this bewildered captain, seemingly unaware of how fast the damage is racking up. It reminds me of that time me and Martha visited that swingers S and M parlor. Apparently, some people just get a kick out of pain. If you notice the torps Hive fired several moments ago, they're about to bear some fruit too, adequately softening the sign up, just enough for the friendly Colorado to finish him off. Hive once again surveying the battlefield, looking for the next one-sided fight he can stick his filthy nose into, as the monk endures in his attempt to capture B. But the stalemate continues, neither team, really making any headway. So the hive looks to see what, if anything, he can do to advance his win rate. The sea capture point looks undefended, and with a friendly battleship there, hive contemplates pushing in for some free XP. And his smoke has now dissipated, so he needs something else to hide behind. Martha, it's just a doll, does it really mean that much to you? Must I really continue with this charade? It's enough to push a man to his depths. I need a Cuban and a bottle of Papi Winkle if I'm to make it through this next eleven minutes. What was that, Martha? Okay, fine. I will settle for a game of backgammon and a rusty trombone. As Hives has a futile attempt at hitting the Fletcher at max range, at least the monk has finally taken B. Hooray for progress. Not that I'm wishing this battle will end sooner, honest. Hive appears to have found some courage, not entirely sure where that's come from, but I guess we must compliment him when it's due, regardless of how much it hurts my soul. 
It all makes sense now. His smoke is off cooldown. Uncle Horatio must be spinning in his grave right about now, watching this spineless jellyfish whimsically showing off. But we see the real you, that same scared little boy, who thought green beans were alive because they felt, and I quote, furry. That's why he is no longer welcome at dinner parties, I remember now. The uncultured swine turned his nose up at our bouffe bourguignon with the accompanying Pinot Noir, instead demanding a can of Stella and beans on toast. Personally, I blame his parents. When I was five, I was going to the theatre to watch Les Miserables, whereas Hive was brought up with nonsense like Thundercats, Airwolf and Knight Rider. But alas, we get some action, lofting his shells over the island at the Alabama. Barely being able to see over the island, much like Martha trying to drive the Continental, needing a cushion to see over the steering wheel. But it's not completely ineffective. He has caused the Alabama to move. What is it with these captains being afraid and hiding in the back? Back in Uncle Horatio's days, they would get close enough to spit on each other. Where has the sense of no guts, no glory gone, I wonder? I'm half expecting a green peace vessel to turn up. After Hive shows a complete lack of care, for the indigenous bird species living on that island he is currently peppering with shots. But he has captured point C, at least, one step closer to getting out of this studio and back to my fencing class, I guess. How much longer can this stalemate continue? Six minutes in and I have already contemplated the meaning of life, concluded the egg came first, and I have written a strongly worded letter to the Olympic Committee to get cottaging recognised as an official sport. As Hive spurred on with some motivational words from the Monk 52 and the accompanying battleship, engaging with the two ships out on the flank, Hive begins to move once more. Let's hope we actually get to see him do some work. And look, the guns do work. The Colorado he gave a paddling to earlier, so focused on his target, fails to see Hive putting him onto a crossfire. With the expected and desired effect of quickly taking the Colorado out of action, Hive quickly turns to engage a much larger threat. Looming on the horizon is another battleship, the dreaded USS Iowa. With its 16-inch guns, the Iowa is not only capable, but likely to send Hive back to port post haste. Fortunately, Hive has smoke, an extremely fair and balanced mechanic that allows a 10,000-ton ship to simply disappear like he sailed into the Bermuda Triangle. As the USS Alabama reverses out into the guns, they're two of the American Navy's finest battleships, so how will they fare? We shouldn't have to wonder for long. Hive has around one minute and 40 seconds to do as much damage as possible. As he maneuvers to get all his guns to bear, it's as if the Alabama is taking pity on him, showing zero regard for his teammates. He shunt into the Iowa, leaving himself exposed, as Hive aims to capitalize on a broadside target, the Alabama at least recognizes his mistake and turns in, reducing how effective Hive's guns can be, leaving Hive to contemplate what ship to focus, what's the biggest threat, with the Iowa reversing and the Alabama pushing forward. They're a clear winner. Hive continues to unleash his guns, with the hope of deterring the two behemoths, but to little avail the Alabama and the Iowa are now both pushing in, and Hive's time is running down. Will he meet his demise when the smoke runs out? Will the torpedoes do enough to allow him to escape? With just 40 seconds left, it's clear Hive is in some serious trouble. As the Alabama moves out of sight, the Iowa, full of confidence and with a deep sense of strength, finds it in himself to expose the full side of his ship not the smartest move, as we are about to see. Hive spots a gap, issuing the full speed ahead command, in the hope his quick exit, coupled with the extensive damage, is enough to evade his impending doom, all the while hitting 150,000 damage and getting the high-caliber medal. He has single-handedly taken 30% of the entire enemy team's hit points, but his guns are still singing. And for some reason, like a deer in headlights, this Iowa seems all too willing to take it and take it all like a champ, nothing says USA like cannon fodder. One American battleship, down over 210,000 damage done and torpedoes out at the Alabama. 
But what is this, a traitor, a tiger? 59 appears on the enemy team, taking the B capture point, the monk so valiantly took earlier. This is simply unacceptable, and he must be vanquished post-haste. As the Alabama takes a single torpedo, the tiger desperately trying to avoid the incoming fire. Hive picks up his Confederate medal, that six ships on the enemy team Hive has taken at least 20% of their hit points from at this point. And he's still not done. The treasonous tiger joins the tea at the bottom of the harbor. And due to technical difficulties, we missed the last few salvos at the Alabama that put Hive over 250,000 damage and his chance at the damage record foiled due to his team hitting 1,000 points. Thankfully, my time here is done. Martha gets her doll back, and I can go back to talking about the finer things in life, such as Egyptian cotton sheets, my Burberry collection, and salad tossing.